and welcome to Answers News for October the 26th, 2020. I'm Avery Foley. I'm here with Brian Osborne hey and guys. Dr. George Purdom. And we have a lovely live studio audience. You guys want to clap and say hello to our online viewers. Yeah. It's great to see. We've, we've, our attendance has just been amazing here, really at, the, here at the mm -hmm. museum and at the ARC. It's great to see um, everybody coming and just enjoying themselves. I was away vacationing somewhere um, this past <laughs> week, which shall remain nameless. So and I can tell you, it's really refreshing to be here and see how many things are open and that you can enjoy the facilities. You can really enjoy them. Um, the places I was at, they were really still shut down. So it's really nice to be able mm. to, people to come here and be able to experience that and do that. Yeah, yeah, that's Absolutely. great. Yeah, then soon our Christmas programs will be starting here in just about a month, I know. Uh, right after that's Thanksgiving. Right. So the if you're looking for somewhere fun to go for Christmas, we'll have our incredible Christmas Town and Christmas Time events going on here. And you can learn all about that on our website. Uh, a couple things here as we get started, we got a few people jumping on uh, YouTube. We have Answers TV. We just want to remind people. We know we've had a few issues with some of our uh, live streaming on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so if you want to make sure you can catch Answers News every week without it going down and all that, um, make sure you subscribe to Answers TV. We live stream it there. They're all archived on there. Um, and that's the best way to watch it um, and uh, be able to enjoy it without any different issues that we've been having with some of the streaming services. And I believe we're up to close to 2,500 total videos of mm -hmm. ours yeah. downloaded yep. to Answers.tv. Yep. adding stuff all when the time. When does your first so. show come up? When does your Yeah, so we're, we're, my husband and I are working on a kid's show. Shoes mm -hmm. off, right? For Answers TV, yep. Uh, shoes off and exploration in God's creation. We're very excited about it, and we're hoping we're going to have it done by the end of November. That's our oh, plan. Oh, very good. Um, oh, very good. So no promises on that. Um, we have three <laughs> children, three and, uh, four and under, so no promises on yeah. that, but we're doing our best. Uh, so we're, we're hoping kids will really enjoy that. The other thing we want to mention uh, again for kids here is Answers VBS. Uh, we have our 2021 VBS, which is Mystery Island, tracking down the one true God. So if you do a VBS at your church, make sure you check out Answers VBS. It's full of apologetics, the gospel message, and really deep biblical truth. Uh, this time helping kids to know who God is, looking at the attributes of God. Um, so an excellent program. Encourage you to check that out for next year. All right. So as people are getting on here, we have okay. just our first little fluff, fun item. Um, just in case, I mean, this is what we've all wanted, right? We've always wanted, I mean, pink pineapples. Who hasn't thought when they looked at a pineapple, I wish my pineapple was pink. <laughs> well, you have pink grapefruit, so why not, why not? pink pineapple? Right, I guess. Well, so, now, sure. if you've always thought that, you can get one, and it'll only cost you 49 bucks. So, mm -hmm. you know, pocket $50. change, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the way, way they've done this, because I was interested from my genetic standpoint, how do you get a pink grapefruit, okay, because they're not normally that color. So I can't find a lot of information out there on it. It's probably because probably it's a trade secret, scary. but they've yeah. had to genetically modify it somehow um, to, they said that it's using the um, carotenoid pigment lycopene. So it's the same thing that's in tomatoes, okay, that gives them their red color. Mm -hmm. So this is the same same pigment, basically, or a form of it that's being produced by the pineapple to give it the pink appearance. Now, would this yeah. be similar to the gumdrop grapes or the cotton candy grapes that were produced not They mentioned ago. that in the article, mm -hmm. yeah. Those guys, are good. Have you guys had any of those? They, they're yeah. good, aren't they? Maybe not natural, it's but they're weird. good. It's like weird. It is candy. a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But apparently said, it's also sweeter, too. Sweeter. sweeter than normal pineapple. And juicier. So. And pineapples can be pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so there you go. Like it. If well, you're it says it's in a sour, supposedly. It's not, it's a more, it sounds like it's a more mellow sort of taste to yeah. a pineapple, but I, I mean, like pineapple. For $49, pineapple. you could find out. It even comes in its own little box. <laughs> they ship it to you in its own little box and everything. No, I don't think so. <laughs> So anyways, and it says if you, right now they have a contest and if you win it, you um, get a virtual cocktail party. I have no idea what how you, that I works. I don't know what that is. No idea. Yeah. No idea. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know how you have virtual cocktails, but um, anyway, so yeah, kind of interesting on that in this day and age. But, uh, yep. Hey, you never know what you might see. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. This next one comes from the, um, from the news site Discern. Black employees experienced racism at Planned Parenthood internal audit. So this is a report that was leaked from Planned Parenthood, an internal audit that was done that determined that employees working there have experienced uh, racism according to this in internal audit that was done. And when I read something like this, I just think, well, I'm not shocked because no. Planned yeah. Parenthood was founded by Margaret Sanger, who was a racist, as racist as can be. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. to me, this is just continuing that idea. Yeah. And like you said, where, where most Planned Parenthood offices They're located are. In, yep, minority neighborhoods and yep. places like that, specifically yep. targeting specific 
community. So big shock, like yeah. not yeah. surprising. Well, I think we were all surprised. They said that Planned Parenthood is looking into addressing their legacy of white supremacy. It's surprising that they, so they admitted, admitted that. that. Yeah, which they don't is normally really good to hear. My to next thought is, why not address your legacy of infanticide? Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's deal with that one too. That'd be maybe even better, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because Sanger, I mean, her ideas, I mean, what was really popular at that time that she was alive and was eugenics, you know, the idea of better in birth, right? And so they, right. it was founded on the ideas of evolution, okay? And so the idea that certain people are higher than other people mm -hmm. and pretty much everybody that was lower had darker skin or looked different from the mm -hmm. European whites because they believed the European whites were the highest, basically, and everyone else was lower and than that. that, of course, is what Sanger was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it, those are the ideas it's founded on. So it's not surprising. One of the things they said is that the, the people that were darker skinned um, were treated like children, okay, um, and uh, that they couldn't accomplish work independently. Well, that, again, that comes out of those ideas of that eugenic movement and those mm -hmm. evolutionary sure. ideas. Even Darwin thought that people that had darker skin and even women were more childlike um, because they had not evolved as much, and so they should be treated like that, like children. And so... Again, I, I personally don't find this shocking. Now, in our current era, people find it shocking, but sure. it, it really right. isn't when you know the history of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Somebody yeah. asked on Facebook here, any chance, in regards to our previous article, that the pink pineapple is strawberry or watermelon flavor? <laughs> Not that of, I know Not of. that I know of. <laughs> yeah. Pineapple, but okay, all right. Yeah. All right, this next one. A gas found on Earth that signifies life has been detected on the clouds on Venus. Oh, wait, that was last month's headline. Sorry. This month's headline is, <laughs> Venus yeah. might not have signs of life after all, <laughs> say astronomers. Whoops. How <laughs> many times do we see this? <laughs> If you so, watch this show at all, you'll know that one week word. they're proclaiming life has been found on another planet. The next week, it's been debunked it's, in some yeah. way, shape, or form. So way back in ancient history in September, we talked yeah. about <laughs> that previous news item that yeah. life signatures of life have been discovered and all these headlines proclaimed how life had been found and... And then all the articles we've seen since then that have talked anything about aliens have always included that finding as evidence, as further evidence for, you know, potential life out in outer space. Well... Yeah, maybe not so much. The, yeah. the same scientists have gone back and looked at their data again and looked at older observations and have discovered maybe our observations weren't correct and maybe right. we haven't actually found signatures of life, this, this uh, phosphine, in the atmosphere at all. I mean, Venus is like super mega hot, okay? So um, it's not a planet we would typically think about finding life on. Normally right. they focus on Mars more um, mm -hmm. because they think things could be buried beneath the surface and sort of out of the cold and out of the UV light and, you know, things that could harm um, life. Uh, but when this phosphine was found, you know, there was a, there was a big woohoo, you know. Because here on Earth it's a signature on of Earth, life. Earth, right, mm -hmm. if, um, living things give off phosphine gas. And so they thought, well, maybe we found some living things. But, but again, the, the data that they're trying to analyze, you've got to remember, they're analyzing Venus. <laughs> We're not there. And so um, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of hard to analyze all mm -hmm. the signatures and things that they get. And when they're compiling all the data... Sometimes errors get introduced, and that's what they think happened, why they may mm -hmm. have gotten the phosphine. Yeah, gas so signature. in this article, she, the, the author of the original paper, who's the one who's doing the second analysis, she says, well, maybe it's just highly variable, so we caught it this one time, and we, and we have missed it other times. Um, maybe it's because it dissipates when it gets further up in the atmosphere, so we're looking, this, this, this other data set is looking in the wrong place. She gives a few options for maybe why, because obviously her team originally believes they found this, so they're like, sure. well, where did it go? So she comes up with a few ideas. But then there's this other study, more doubts cast on potential signs of life on Venus, which a second analysis by a different group of people found the same thing. There's no phosphine on Venus, they say. It was an error that crept in as they were trying to eliminate statistical noise and stuff. Certain errors crept in, and one of those was the signature of phosphine. Well, if you boil is what it they're down, claiming. they were kind of basically saying the data is pretty fuzzy because we're doing something so far away, mm -hmm. can't get a clear look at it. And it kind of boils down to this. The more fuzzy the data the more wide open it is to random interpretations mm -hmm. based on a yeah. worldview. It's and, very difficult. But it is yeah. good to see that scientists are fact-checking themselves, yeah. um, so yep. to speak. That's I mean, science, this is how right? science works, right? So somebody puts mm -hmm. out a study, and then someone tried to repeat it, or they said, well, we need to look over our data again, and they found out that it, you know, it, it may not be a valid signature. And that's good, because that's how science works. That's how observational science mm -hmm. works. Um, and so I, I just wish they would do this more with when it comes to evolutionary Evolution. science because <laughs> 
But it is a different type of science. This is a observational science. It's something that we can observe in the here and now and continue to to use the scientific method on, but things like Test evolution and creation, repeat. they're past events, they're historical events. Yeah. And so it's, you can't test, repeat, or really, you know, um, study them in the same way that we study mm -hmm. science yeah. today. And it's very worldview based, whereas mm -hmm. this is very um, based on, again, more the data, so right. to speak, mm -hmm. and what we actually yeah. see. But and then you bring in the idea that there might be life, and that's yeah. more of an evolutionary interpretation, right? right. Because that's in the evolutionary evolved, view, yeah. life, if life evolved here on Earth, it had to have evolved mm -hmm. elsewhere. So that brings in that evolutionary interpretation there. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say the same thing Avery just said. Actually, one person, one scientist said, this isn't a big gotcha. It just shows we got to do more research in our data. But it does show the power of right. your worldview. Mm -hmm. They assume evolution is true and life must have evolved somewhere else. So we'll find it eventually. So they're really looking hard right. for it. And uh, actually, if you're watching the show last week, they had thought a particular star was twinkling in a pretty weird way. And they couldn't explain why it had this really random twinkling, so-called. And they suspected their best guess was maybe an alien megastructure was blocking our view of the star, giving it the random twinkle that we saw, the random vibrations oh. in the light. They did yeah. more studies, come to find out it was just dust, not a mega alien structure. It's a little less exciting. <laughs> but you see their worldview really being yeah. permeating their conclusions on these Well, and even they, here, they're trying to, she, you know, because she brings up, well, maybe it's this, well, maybe it's this, well, maybe it's this. They still want it to be there because the idea of life on another planet is mm -hmm. so tantalizing. And if life evolved here on Earth, yeah. and Earth has only been around four and a half billion years, then it should have evolved elsewhere um, And because these places are much older than Earth. And so... You know, they yeah. want to still keep that idea alive, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, the next one comes from the Sydney Morning Herald. Pope Francis calls for civil union laws for same-sex couples. Okay. So this is about a feature-length documentary that will be coming out featuring, um, it's, it's about Pope Francis, but it's, it's focusing more on the crisis and tragedies that are going on in the world and his solutions to some of those, what mm -hmm. he suggests right. would be a good solution to some of these different things that are going on around the world. Um, so that's kind of the focus of the documentary. And in, in it, they, there's an interview with him that's been released where he talks about how homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God, he says. And he endorses civil union laws so that these um, relationships are legally covered. Right. And, you know, honestly, I know this is, you know, this has made a lot of news headlines and mm -hmm. people are like, oh, yeah. what's happening? But I don't think it should be all that surprising because um, no. this Pope especially has seemed very liberal, quote unquote, in his views. And again, Catholicism, um, you know, especially with what he's, what he's talking about here, he doesn't hold to even the Genesis account of creation. Right. He believes yeah. in evolution. He's wanting to redefine the family because he says homosexual people people have a right to be in a family, in other words, be in a union, so, um, and married, um, and he says they're all children of God, right? The idea that everybody is a child of God, a kind of a universalist view yeah. of salvation, rather than, you know, no, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, right? Not That's through right. our works, not through God just loves everyone and everyone's going to heaven view. So mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. it's all that surprising to be honest. Well, that's yeah. a common misnomer that we're all children of God. The Pope should know better, right? The Bible's clear that we're all made in God's image. We're all mm -hmm. God's creation, Absolutely. no doubt, but we're not all children of God. Interesting, if you look at Jesus, when he gauged the Pharisees on numerous occasions, one time they were telling him that they were sons of Abraham. That was their way of salvation, more or less. And he said to them, you are of your father, the devil, and your will to do your father's desires. You see, as sinners, we're born sinners by nature, by choice. We are born as children of the devil in a sense. We're born in God's image, but we're not a child of God until we repent and put our faith in Christ. And then you become a new creation, become a genuine child of God. And so that's a clear distinction that the Pope is missing and many people mm -hmm. miss as well. Yeah. And one of the things I know, I remember too, there was, I think it was a couple years ago, there was a little boy who had talked to the Pope, this, this Pope about um, his problems with, um, his, oh, his yeah. father had died. It was a little boy. I mean, I feel right. bad for him. His father had died and he said his father was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. So is his father in heaven? And there was big news headlines about that because the Pope, well, he didn't come right out and say that the father right. was in heaven. He said, well, the father had done a lot of good things. And so God would want him close to him. And I'm like, yeah. no, that's not, you know, and again, he said that idea that everyone is a child of God. And I, and, you know, so it's blatantly going against what 
God's word says about mm -hmm. salvation. It's not about what we do because yeah. we can never be good enough, right? It's about what mm -hmm. Christ did, right? And it mm -hmm. is finished, right? It's, it, so that shows right there. It's not, that's not the gospel that, that he is espousing in here, but rather um, the idea, his own opinions, right? We have yeah. to remember these yeah. aren't things that come from the Bible, rather they're his opinions on these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the Bible isn't your ultimate starting point for truth, then you're right. going to drift into error on all kinds yeah. of different things, um, including when it comes to marriage and family. We, we look at that. We look to God's word to define that, not our own opinions, not our own emotions. We look to the word of God well, for that. We also see in the documentary, there's a particular person who claims homosexuality, and they said he talked to the Pope, and he said the Pope told him that God made him gay. So this mm -hmm. came from the Pope. And Georgia, you've got a whole presentation on that issue from yeah. a genetics perspective. He shed well, some light on that. Well, just really looking, you know, because that's one of the most asked questions I get is, you know, because I'm a geneticist, people will say, well, is, is being gay, is that something that you're just born with, that you can't help yourself? And I have looked at numerous um, genetic studies as well as other types of physiological studies that have been done, and I haven't seen any evidence for this whatsoever. Um, and so to say that, you know, someone's born that way, I mean, what, I mean, what are we going to get to? with that. Somebody's born a liar. They're born a stealer. They're born an adulterer. Um, right. You know, where does it, yeah. I mean. Yeah. And, you, and, and then you bring this up at the end of your presentation. Yeah. In a sense, a person is born that way because we're all born into sin, right? right? Exactly. Every single one exactly. of us is born with sinful inclinations one way or another. And we can't say, well, God made us that way. Well, we're all born into sin and we're called mm -hmm. to repent, turn from that sin and put our faith and trust in Christ and live for his glory, not for our own feelings right. and emotions and desires. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Yes, we're all born into sin, but the hope is not found in following a sinful lifestyle. It's found in right, repenting and right, putting your faith and trust right. in Christ. Well, and let's be clear. Having a sinful inclination does not justify or make right. normal that right. inclination. Mm -hmm. right? Someone who's inclined towards violence, that doesn't justify them beating their wife. Someone mm -hmm. justified right, through right, right. promiscuity is not justified in adultery. Someone inclined towards being attracted to children, mm -hmm. they're not justified right. in pedophilia. Right. Right? Sin is sin no matter how we feel about it. And praise mm -hmm. God, Christ paid the price for that sin on the cross. Amen. You put your faith in him. Yeah, and gives us the power to defeat it by his Holy Spirit and his word. Right. And, you know, I think of the passage in, um, oh, see, I knew I, if I think about it, I won't get it right. But it says such, I think it's 1 Corinthians, but such were some of yeah, you. Yeah, 1 right? Corinthians 6. Yeah, you're not, you're not that way anymore. Mm -hmm. you're, right. you're different. You've been redeemed from that. And God, and through the gospel, can provide freedom from these things. It's not somebody that has to live with these things the rest of their life. They, right. can, they can enjoy the freedom that, um, in Christ, a freedom from um, sin and mm, the power you know, of hope sin has and been the truth of God's cross. word. Right, yeah. Mm. So, that's a very clear biblical view that the Pope in many cases doesn't seem to have on many issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The yeah. current one anyway. All right. The next one comes from the Christian Post. Wikipedia bans editors from expressing support for traditional marriage. What? Come on now. So <laughs> Wikipedia, which of course everybody's familiar with that, the world's free encyclopedia that always gets everything right. Always. Um, they have basically restricted their editors from using these, they call them badges, on their profile page that, that express support for what they call traditional marriage. They're not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. And it just, to me, when I read this, I thought, since when has Wikipedia been neutral? Yeah. I mean, last time I sure. checked, they've, they've not been neutral for a very long yeah. time. Apparently and their co-founder came out a few months ago and said the site's neutrality policy was dead. They're not neutral. And it's like, Was well, it ever alive? Was it? Uh, were that, what? Uh, <laughs> like, I don't think they understand the, the, what yeah. the neutrality right. is. You can't yeah. actually be neutral. Your worldview is going to color everything. And you see that when you go on. Well, and by saying and they're not, stuff. they're saying, well, you know, someone like me couldn't be on Wikipedia and have a badge that says I support traditional marriage or between a man and a woman because I'm discriminating. But then they're discriminating against yep. me sure. by saying I can't have that. There's no, there's they're no imposing way to, their secular religion yeah. on. There's no way to not be discriminatory. Else. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to discriminate against somebody. Then in well, that. they call those mm -hmm. who reject so-called same-sex marriage. They called them homophobic. But reject, by rejecting traditional biblical marriage, they're being Christophobic, biblical phobic, Christian phobic. <laughs> right? Everyone has a phobia of something because you have a worldview. As you said earlier, Avery, there is no neutrality. Mm -hmm. Either God's word is your authority or it's not. You gotta pick one or the other. Yeah. And the other thing too is one of the things they said is um, they don't want their Wikipedia entries to follow the idea of um, 
should avoid what's called false balance. And I thought, well, this is a new term. I haven't heard this before. So I decided to look it up on Wikipedia. And it <laughs> said, um, it said it, another name for it, and I'm not joking, is both sidism. Okay? So the idea of presenting both sides of something. So they said, um, basically, that journalists, it's when journalists present an issue as being more balanced between opposing viewpoints than the evidence suggests. And the example they give is like somebody, like a journalist saying, well, let's hear from somebody that believes in evolution, and now let's hear from somebody that believes in intelligent design <laughs> or creation, right? So they would say that's a false balance because there's way more evidence for evolution than there is for creation. So you shouldn't even give the creationists a chance to talk because the evidence yeah. isn't with them. Very neutral. Right? Very neutral. And I thought that's very, this idea of avoiding false balance is very, very problematic because it's very worldview dependent. Right, You're yeah. then deciding if the evidence, you know, which has the most evidence and which should be talked about. And when it, it comes to creation evolution, yeah. it's an interpretation of the evidence, right, which exactly. comes from your worldview. So it's, yeah. yeah, like there's no neutrality. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you look up their entry on Jesus... It's it's very liberal, very yeah. very liberal. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. basically just like your your liberal criticisms of Christ, and they they say things like the Gospels yeah. are not independent nor are consistent records of Christ's life and things like that. So there there's no neutrality on there. If you go and you look up like Ken Ham on their page, it's dreadful, <laughs> so full of so many inconsistencies. You look up Answers in Genesis what? or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. just like it's awful. <laughs> well, somebody <laughs> so on. awful. Somebody on here addressing it to you, Brian, says, doesn't Wikipedia misrepresent answers in Genesis on their website? Yeah, just a little bit. Just oh, a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, they do. They misrepresent a lot of things within Christianity. Well, so. let's, let's be fair. We expect the secular worldview, the secularists, to impose their worldview on how they view reality. And they admit as much. We're not being mm -hmm. neutral. We view the world from this perspective. This is how we will present it to people who read our stuff. And so they're being clear about that. And they recognize that. And it's about time that we as Christians really understand that as well, that there is no neutrality. I mean, how many times have Christians bought into that lie? Well, there is a neutral. Mm -hmm. Let's meet on neutral ground. The bottom line, every issue, moral origins issues, it comes down to authority. Whose right. word is mm -hmm. the authority? Either God's word is, and we build our thinking from there, or God's word is not, and man's word in some way, shape, or form becomes your ultimate authority. And so if we reject God's word in a particular interaction with someone, we're assuming their foundational premise that man's word is the authority. Right. There is no neutral. Stand on God's word. Don't yeah. be ashamed of that. And when you do, you can defend your faith and give answers and proclaim mm -hmm. the gospel effectively. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, this next one. This is exactly what you want to find in your house. <laughs> Near uncrushable I I beetle be awesome. exoskeleton yes. could inspire tough <laughs> structures. So this is a beetle called the diabolical ironclad beetle. Wait, can you say that name again? <laughs> diabolical <laughs> ironclad beetle. That's so an awesome name. Someone had fun naming that one, and it is. Oh, that's pretty cool. It, it's a tough little. A critter. man made that name. You know he did. <laughs> so they basically yeah. they ran it over with a truck, and it still kept going. It and didn't that was die. That's man's idea too. That's awesome. <laughs> I <laughs> were like, yeah, we just drove over it with a truck and it just, it's still, it's still alive. So they basically, this, this particular beetle is able to survive being compressed, obviously run over by a truck, compressed a lot. Yeah. And so they're looking at this and they're like, this is crazy. This is incredible. And they're using what they're learning by studying this beetle um, to try and design new aircraft that are stronger, but lighter. So they use less fuel. Right. Um, they're more efficient, don't pollute as much, things like that. Um, so looking at what God has made and building from, you know, oh, biomimicry, biomimicry, copying what God yeah. has made. Right. And it's really cool, too. It has to do with the actual joints that are formed between the segments and not so much the actual exoskeleton, but the way that it's joined together seems right. to be the key to it not being crushed. And But one of the things that this, I had to laugh when I read this, it says, um, when talking about the beetle, it says no need to reinvent the wheel. Just figure out what nature's done. Okay. And um, nature hasn't done anything, right? Nope. Nature doesn't have a mind. <laughs> nature doesn't design. Right. Evolution doesn't do any of those things. Um, mm -hmm. This is clearly a design by God um, to help this beetle in a fallen world be able to protect itself and um, do this in an incredible way that we can even learn from it and oh, be yeah. able yeah. to design and engineer things to be safer in a fallen world like airplanes <laughs> yep. um, so they don't <laughs> fall from the sky and things like that. That's a good thing. <laughs> But it's neat to see scientists looking at what God has made, and and it's it's frustrating though when you re, when you read this and you see them giving credit 
to nature. Mm -hmm. It's that I, I'm reading this really fascinating book on jellyfish right now at home. And it's, it's just this amazing book about how complicated they are. And then they keep just being like, this is amazing. Look what evolution has done. And it just drives me nuts every time because it's, as I'm reading the book, I'm just being inspired to worship God and just be like, God, you are amazing. Look what you have just one little tiny part of everything that you've made. And it's so complex. Scientists can study it their whole life and never know enough about it to, to really explain it all. And yet they're worshiping evolution for it instead of worshiping the one who actually deserves the credit. Wait. The one who, who designed it. You're reading God. an entire book on jellyfish? It's a fascinating book. If you ignore the evolutionary part. Really my poor husband just hears jellyfish facts all the time now. So. <laughs> but they do try to explain at the very end about how evolution can do this. It just said, well, maybe, how could it have evolved such a tough exoskeleton? It said, maybe it was just exposed to a more dangerous environment than other beetles. Okay, so in other words, because there were, you know, it was more dangerous, the beetle was like, ooh, I better evolve something that keeps me safe. Now, it doesn't think that, right? They just say by accident, by random right. chance, this beetle got Im improvements that were able to make mm -hmm. it survive better. But but this is this is amazingly complex. So yeah. it didn't do it instantly because that's not how first. evolution yeah. works. So what did mm -hmm. it do in the meantime? Mm -hmm. And died. just having a dangerous <laughs> environment doesn't explain where the information comes from right, to be able to code right. for no, this. Like no. information doesn't spontaneously appear just because you have a dangerous environment. That's that's never been observed. That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. so, and let's be clear: natural yeah. selection is a real thing. But natural mm -hmm. selection and mutations tend to shuffle existing genetic information or lose it over time, not right. gain it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, this next one comes from earth.com. Mammals and birds became warm-blooded after surviving a mass extinction. Alrighty then. So this article starts by painting a picture of the world 252 million years ago. There's all these massive volcanoes erupting in Siberia. And there's this mass extinction that kills 95% of life on Earth. And the only things that manage to survive um, are the ancestors of both mammals and birds and a few other things. And they just happen to, at the same time, along with these other groups, evolve warm-bloodedness at the same time. Change instantly. Morphology. Instantly. Dramatically. It right. literally says instantly. Yeah. I don't no. know what that means in evolutionary terms because, mm -hmm. well, they say the experts were surprised to see that this posture shift, in other words, they're saying the animals went from walking on all Sprawling. fours, yeah. right, to walking And became upright. warm -blooded. two different things, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Both animals, and, or both mammals and birds, it says it happened instantly, not over tens of millions of years as had been suggested. Okay, that's not how evolution works, right? right. So I don't know if by instant they mean like a million years or, you know, right, yeah. what, but right. it's... Yeah. Nothing happened instantly when you're depending on random chance. Well, they said as they looked <laughs> at the fossil time. record, they're not finding any transitions from walking in the sprawled format to the upright format. Like, they're totally no formed and functioning. Like, totally, totally two different design things doing different things according to their, their design by God, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's just storytelling. I mean, that's all it is. They're trying mm -hmm. to figure I think out. We all three you know, said that as we read through. Yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. how many. And and I think too, Dr. David Minton, who's our anatomist here, one of the things he'll always say is evolution. He'll say evolution must have got really lucky. Yeah, <laughs> and well, that's what I luck. say when I was reading this. I thought I could hear him saying that. Like evolution <laughs> must have got really lucky because mm -hmm. they learned how to stand upright, and that helped them be able to avoid predators better, and you know, do all these other things that maintain body temperature better because now they're endothermic too. They're maintaining, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. generating their own heat. And so, you know, it's just more and more storytelling mm -hmm. to try to explain. It really it, shows so. you how the interpretation drive, or um, when you're looking at the evidence, it's driven by the interpretation, right. um, your worldview behind that, because you look at this and you're, they're looking at flood sediment. They're looking at creatures that were buried yeah. during the flood and they're interpreting it in a completely different way. And then they're running into these problems of like, how do we explain this? Well, because in an evolutionary worldview, it doesn't fit because they're interpreting the evidence from the completely wrong starting point. They should mm -hmm. be looking right. at God's word and understanding there was a global flood that rapidly buried these creatures. They're not separated by eons of time. Um, so, so speaking of evolution and storytelling, this last <laughs> one here from this Popular Mechanics, weird. animals keep evolving into crabs, which is somewhat disturbing. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what? what? Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at this article, it's talking about a process they call car carcanization, caraconization. Better go. known as crabification. Yep. And it's basically this idea that crab, <laughs> the form of a crab, has evolved five different times independently in different groups of creatures. And they say, of course, that's due to environmental stressors, which we've already discussed, doesn't create gen brand new genetic information anyway. But um, so they say, yeah, crabs, the form of crabs has evolved five, five different, different times. times. 
in this crustacean. So they would say that crustaceans evolved into a crab-like form from mm -hmm. a non-crab-like form. Okay, so it wasn't looking like a crab, and then for whatever reason, it did. So they're saying five different lines. So this evolved five different times independent. A lot of times. They all by Something chance happened to be um, on the same basic idea evolved of becoming a crab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is just the idea of convergent evolution, which is basically different groups evolve the same features or very similar features to accomplish very similar things. And so they'll, they'll, you were saying earlier, Brian, yeah. that they point to similarities between groups and say, this is evidence of a common ancestor. Right. And then when they see similarities from groups that they don't believe share a common ancestor, it's evidence of convergent evolution. So it just explains everything. Everything proves evolution one way or another, yeah. right? Which just shows again the power of their worldview, as mm -hmm. you mentioned a second ago. I love the subtitle on the very opening line here. It says, animals keep evolving in the crabs. That's disturbing. It's okay if, that, if this weirds you out. <laughs> I just love the subtitle. Yeah, that's true. It should be okay. Yeah, uh, and, and we hear convergent evolution all the time. Convergent evolution is like their, you know, their, this is their fallback thing. Like yeah. if they yeah. can't explain it any other way, okay, if they can't explain why totally different groups look similar in the end, they'll say, oh, if they don't have it, because they can't explain it by shared ancestry, because some of these groups are so different from one another, Correct. they'll say convergent evolution. You know, they all must have just by chance to. happened on the same design in five different groups five randomly. Five different times. And it, I mean, it's worse than this. There are some we've seen, I think it's like 120 different groups. I think it was like, this must have evolved on its own, you know, the same way, 120 different times. I don't forget what it was, but we did a paper like that once and I thought, yeah, really? I really? How many times, I mean, would you think this would happen, you know, by chance mm -hmm. the same way? And, and so again, what we're seeing is common design Right, mm -hmm. and that God created these things. They didn't evolve into crabs or right. crab-like creatures. They are that. Mm -hmm. They have Just similar structures. Right, mm -hmm. and he even mm -hmm. said their innards are different on another paper I read it yeah. on this, because I was like, this is a new one. I mean, I'm a biologist, and I have not heard of this before. Um, <laughs> Never heard of and so I was like, before. well, okay. <laughs> but their innards are different, so to speak. I mean, they're, they do things differently inside. Just because mm -hmm. they look the same on the outside doesn't mean everything's happening the same on the inside. So they still are very distinctive groups. Mm -hmm. They just have a similar structure. And, and yeah. you can tell, like when you read this sort of thing in the previous article, that they are reaching... They are stretching, oh, yeah. right? And sometimes it's easy to look at that and think, well, are they very bright? And here's the thing. They are. They, mm -hmm. These are smart people. They are not yeah. dumb. They're intelligent. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. especially probably well educated in their particular field. Their problem is they have the wrong starting point about yep. the unseen past. They're trusting mm -hmm. man's ideas instead of God's word about history and wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Yep. Somebody mm -hmm. said, are those evolving animals crabby as a result of their supposed evolution? <laughs> yeah, somebody on here put their little I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, all the crab puns are going to roll in They're now. I'm crabby. sure people will come up with good ones. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just looking at that, you just see the power of the of your starting point and how right. you're going to interpret things very different. We look at that and we see that God has created an incredible diversity of creatures and he's used the same design. I mean, like the one article is that don't reinvent the wheel, right? Like God, right. You, this, right. you, we live in the same world, yeah. we eat the same things, we have to, you know, survive in the same world. So God used the same design in different groups to accomplish mm -hmm. similar purposes. And we'd expect that from a master designer, master engineer. Yeah. Um, but different starting points, different interpretations. Yeah. So that is everything that we have for you today. We hope you'll join um, Answers News team again on Wednesday for our next episode. Thank you so much. See you guys.